We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Donald Trump has won the presidency for a second time. Today we'll talk about the Trump comeback, why it happened, and what to expect. Welcome to The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today we're talking once again with Eugene Perrier. Eugene is an author, he's a political organizer, and he is the co-host of Freedom Side Live, a live video show every Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Breakthrough News. Eugene, welcome back. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Eugene, uh, yeah, thank you for joining. Uh, big day today. Yesterday was the election. Uh, much talked about election. When you think about what actually happened, Donald Trump won the popular vote. He got about, I don't know, 71, 72 million votes. They're not fully counted. Maybe it'll little, be a little bit more. He won the Electoral College. I mean, four years ago, Eugene, uh, Joe Biden won by a great, a greater margin than that in terms of popular vote. The Democrats controlled the House and the Senate. What happened from your point of view? Yes, well, there's quite a bit here. And I think when we look at the overall issue of turnout, I mean, let's zero in on a couple points. I mean, obviously, turnout overall was lower. You see the Democrats in and of themselves. And of course, you know, some of these numbers will take them with a grain of salt, because as you mentioned, you know, they will change a little bit as more states come in. But I think, you know, you can take them as rough proxies. Uh, the Democrats losing something like 14 million votes, Trump losing nearly 2 million votes. I mean, very significantly, one of the major factors I think we just have to say is a lot of people who voted in the last election election cycle just stayed home. Now, the question is, why did they stay home? Now, there are a lot of different reasons why that may be and why we may be seeing some of these pieces, but I want to hone in on one particular piece, Brian, and that is, if you compare 2020 to 2024, the percentage of the electorate of people making under $100,000 went down 14%. And I'll just give you some specific numbers. It went down about 6% uh, of people making between fifty dollars and $100,000, 4% for those making between thirty dollars and $50,000, and 3% for those making under $30,000. But by and large, the vast majority of voters, because 74% of voters in 2020 and 60% of voters in 2024 are making under $100,000. So in the subset of the demographic that makes up the majority of voters, you saw about a 14% decline uh, roughly in terms of the percentage they made up of the electorate. Now, I find that particularly notable because when you look at you know, what's going on with the economy, what people say uh, uh, is, which people were saying was their major issue. It's kind of always the economy, right? Because we live under capitalism. So, you know, your your paycheck is your ration card. So, of course, people are always going to be primarily concerned with how to have, you know, shelter, food, clothing, so on and so forth. But again, we are seeing this issue and we're at a moment where we are coming out of one of the largest inflationary spirals that many people have seen in their entire lifetime. That is one of the most significant in this sort of, you know, modern history that we can actually measure where the cost of living crisis in the United States for almost all people has skyrocketed. I mean, you have the Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey saying that there's 155 million people roughly who are having trouble making ends meet week to week. 21 million people roughly that at least sometime in the past week actually went hungry. So the level of, of hardship is so significant. I mean, you saw, you know, 90 some percent of black respondents under 30 just tell the New York Times Times that the economy was poor or fair. We've seen the New York Times poll that also showed something close to 70% of people in the United States thinks the economy needs to be massively transformed or completely torn down. I mean, you see a reality when you look at uh, inflation and wages where year over year, uh, wages have gone up about 4%, but the cost of housing has gone up about 4.9%. Uh, the cost of eating food away from home has gone up about 4%. The cost of electricity has gone up about 4%. So, you know, your rent isn't, your wages aren't keeping up with your rent. They're barely keeping up or basically on par with the cost of powering your home, your internet, your air conditioning, you know, your electricity in all certainly different regards. And, you know, the cost of going out with your friends to try to have a good time and forget some of these bad times has also basically been essentially the same increase in cost as your wages. And so you're seeing 
mean that people's ability to survive is not actually keeping up with their incomes. So then you put that together with the fact that you have a 14% reduction in terms of uh, percentage of the electorate of people making a hundred oh, uh, under a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and below. And I think you can start to see that a big part of what took place in the 2024 election here was a large number of working class people just did not believe that either of the two party candidates had any you know, solution for this massive crisis that was affecting them. And many of them chose not to vote. And that heavily affected all of the other issues that, of course, uh, were playing into the election. And there are many other issues. I mean, of course, there was the anger with the Democratic Party uh, amongst, you know, many of its core supporters over their complicity and participation in the genocide in Gaza. There was the manipulation of the, the immigration issue here in the United States, where a lot of the economic hardship was sort of placed on the backs of immigrants and a lot of the popular discourse and where both major parties essentially pandered to that reality. There is, you know, we're in a, in a, in a rapidly changing cultural environment in this America and there is a huge amount of demagogy uh, around the issue, for instance, of trans rights and trying to uh, exploit the, the, you know, the various different views people may have um, uh, about the trans community that are incorrect or wrong or bigoted or whatever they may be. So you have a million different factors that we could lay out here. And I don't want to just say, you know, it's all one factor, Brian, but I think it's very notable that we are in a massive situation of economic crisis, cost of living crisis, in almost every single country, by the way, the leader who is in, that's had elections since 2021 to now, uh, the leader who is in power during this inflationary crisis has been turfed out regardless of their politics. I think we're seeing a similar trend here in the United States of America that after the massive COVID-19 crisis, people have seen that there is this huge corporate smash and grab raid that drove up prices, you know, massively uh, only for the 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 the, the needs of corporate profiteering. And also after we had seen over COVID how easy it is to uh, do things that help working class people and people just could not fathom that the political system was offering them so little in terms of actual solutions to their core economic issues, in addition to the other issues you have, that you have tens of millions of people sit the election out, and you have many more people be very angry and either vote directly against the Democrats or perhaps for a third party and preventing the Democrats from, you know, building a broad-based base coalition. Although it's worth saying that the third party difference was not enough to make the difference. But I think it speaks to the same point that people are outraged. They're not voting. They're voting for third parties. They're doing protest votes against the Democrats. I mean, Kamala Harris lost this race. The Biden administration, the Democratic Party lost this race because they could not offer an alternative to the Republican far right agenda that also is offering no solutions, but was able to speak more substantially to a larger subset of the population. Kamala Harris ran really basically politically as a as what we used to call a Reagan Democrat. I mean, she kept bemoaning the fact that, and so did Biden, that the Republican Party, which used to be the great party of Ronald Reagan, is now uh, dominated by Trump. And she has Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney and all of these warmongers uh, who, like, make up the military-industrial complex and, and who have been, you know, taking the country to war after war, looting the national treasury for endless war spending. I mean, it's almost a trillion a year. Uh, and, then, and then now blaming the country for going to the right. Like you see all of these liberal commentators who are pro Kamala Harris say, look, these, um, these people in the United States are so backward, so reactionary. They voted for this racist, this reactionary uh, xenophobe, Donald Trump, this misogynist. Well, you know, Eugene, the Democrats had control of the House and the Senate and the White House. They could have done anything they wanted in the last four years, and they apparently did do whatever they wanted, and it didn't satisfy the needs of working class people. Kamala Harris, let's go back to inflation. She said, well, uh, price gouging is bad. Well, all of the inflation is price gouging. I mean, pr inflation isn't something from God. It's not divinely mandated. Capitalist companies raise prices. And so the government has the ability, the executive authority, to be able to do something about it. And Kamala Harris and, and Biden maybe whined about it once in a while when they were trying to get votes. They did nothing to stop this looting of the working class, which is called inflation, but it's really looting for corporate profit. 
No, I think it's a, that's a very good point. I mean, the Economic Policy Institute, who's done a lot of study on this issue and sort of the height of the inflationary spiral, was saying that 50-odd cents of every dollar of inflation was going towards corporate profits. I think if you average it out from 2021 now to 2024, it's a little bit less than that. But you can still see a substantial amount of every dollar of inflation is going directly to corporate profits. So there is actually no doubt whatsoever that this was the case. Uh, it's been you know proven in many different ways. There are a number of other aspects that sort of spoke to this, you know, especially the issue of concentration in certain industries, especially the meatpacking industry and others, where you have this collusion between the various different companies to keep the prices uh, at the level that they want to keep them at. And, you know, it just everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, it's just very clear that there is a, a, a corporate price gouging reality. But the point uh, I think that's deeper here is that there is no real answer coming from the Biden-Harris administration. I mean, the irony is that the White House actually put out a number of very good reports and studies actually laying out the role of corporate profiteering, monopolization, and other things uh, uh, that were causing inflation, but they took no real substantial action. I mean, of course, they didn't try to put in any sort of price controls or price caps of any significance. And the Kamala Harris plan for inflation was never really explained. She said that she was going to keep your grocery prices down, and she said it over and over and over and over again. Well, of course, everyone wants to hear that, that grocery prices certainly won't go up and will start to go down. But she never really explained how she was going to do it. And the one thing that she sort of shied away from directly was the overall issue of, of price caps and saying they weren't going to do that. I, I mean, it's maybe not even all that worth getting into it now that the election is over. But, you know, her plan essentially was to make it easier for the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, to sue companies over uh, price gouging, which means that, you know, two years down the line after you get through some long uh, court case, a company might have to pay a fine and be held responsible. Now, of course, the thought from the people who support this kind of thing is is the fear of being charged like that, uh, you know, will help will prevent people from raising their prices. But I think we know that the fear of regulation doesn't really prevent big corporations in America from doing anything whatsoever. So, you know, it, it was never explained because it doesn't sound like it's going to work. It probably wouldn't work because as a number of people pointed out, commentators at the time, there are dozens of states, including Republican-led states, that have very similar provisions in, in, in uh, power and none of them were really used to bring down prices in any substantial way over the course of the inflationary price spiral. So she was speaking to the issue, but not actually providing a solution that meets the scale of the problem or a solution that's intelligible to anyone whatsoever at all. Now, Trump's plan is, you know, equally as, 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 as you know, not likely to succeed. It's basically, we're just going to drill for more oil and we're going to lower gas prices. And trust me, if there's lower gas prices, that means lower energy prices, which means lower prices across the board. We don't have the time to go through all of this here about why that's probably would not be how it works out. But the point being, it had at least an Occam's razor element to it, right? Like you could sort of look at it and see, this is basically what he's saying. Um, you know, this is what he's going to do, sort of simply kind of makes sense to you, while the other side, the Harris side is doing nothing whatsoever. So, I mean, I think you can see on the one hand, the promises of the two sides were falling on a lot of deaf ears. And that's why people making under 100000 dollars were, you know, 14% less of the electorate this year, because I think there are a lot of people who saw through both uh, candidates. But either way, I think when you look at the weakness of the Democrats in the election, you have to look very significantly, uh, you know, at that that issue. And, and I think you have to look at, you know, also the inability, as you've pointed out, to have done anything about this during the course of their four years. In addition to what her plan was going forward, they didn't do much of anything going backwards other than just put out reports and things like that. In addition to all the other promises from Build Back Better and so on and so forth, the Democrats, you know, failed to deliver. I mean, Kamala Harris is saying we should increase increase the national minimum wage to $15 an hour, that obviously would have to pass Congress. And if they can't pass the signature agenda of Joe Biden across a range of programs, where they control the House, the Senate and the presidency, you know, how could you expect them in a potential era of divided government to just pass one policy like raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour? So you can see, I think there's also a credibility gap in terms of what is, is out there. And I think when you look at people saying in polls, they trust Trump to handle the economy more than they trust. Harris, I think a lot of that is the credibility gap of the inability to actually address the price spiral as it was happening, the inability to actually deliver on things like a child tax credit and other social protections that people uh, enjoyed during the sort of brief pandemic uh, Goldilocks zone there for social policy. And I think it's the inability pr to present a plan going forward that was actually credible in terms of people being able to understand how the policies were going to translate into lower prices in the midst of a massive cost of living crisis. So we had lower voter turnout, especially from working class people. That was a big 
big part of it. Lack of enthusiasm. CNN exit poll asked people, how many of you are enthusiastic about the state of the country? That would be 7%. How many are satisfied? That would be 19%. So 26% are either enthusiastic or satisfied. Those are the people who are doing very well. Who are, how many are dissatisfied? 43%. How many are angry? 29%. That's almost one third. I mean, this is the reality for people. And Eugene, if you look around the world, and you mentioned this in the beginning, it's not just in the United States. Incumbent governments in capitalist economies are falling. You had the uh, government, the right-wing government, the Tory government, was turned out in the UK, replaced by a Labour government, which is also pretty right-wing. Uh, of course, in, Macron, in, in France, you had Macron uh, do the snap election, thinking his center capitalist party would sort of come back. That was a disaster for him. The far right and also an organized left under the form of a popular front also gained votes. But the capitalist uh, center was defeated, basically. In Japan, the Liberal Democratic Party, which has been basically one party rule since the U.S., set up the post-World War II Japanese political order, they lost. And the ANC in South Africa, I mean, uh, in South Africa, again, had a political revolution against apartheid, but it's still a capitalist country. So in all of these capitalist countries, uh, the working classes, the middle class, the poor, uh, anyway, they weren't either enthusiastic or angry about the incumbency, and so those incumbents have lost. So what we, when you look at the big picture here, you must come to the conclusion that the, the crisis of the Democratic Party or the failure of the Democratic Party is really associated with a global failure of the major capitalist countries that dominate the global capitalist economy. I think that's important because instead of the left hand-wringing uh, or engaged in hand-wringing or blaming workers and voters for being too right-wing, I think we need to sharpen the attack and make it even more persuasive to more people that the problem is capitalism and the solution is, in fact, a socialist reconstruction or reorganization of the economy because inflation, wage uh, deficits or wage deflation, uh, unaffordable housing, medical care that's out of reach, all of these are solvable problems. These are the problems of capitalism. The socialist program is actually achievable and people's needs could be met, we have to convince people about it. Go ahead. I think it's a good point. You could also add Argentina. You could add uh, Australia to that. I mean, I think you could link it also in a major way to the state elections that we've seen in Germany, where the issue of the war in Ukraine, which has really been behind this massive spiraling cost of living crisis there, uh, became a flashpoint in these state elections that don't even, you know, actually reflect on national policy. Um, but now you can see that even the leaders at the state level to form their governments are looking to sort of appeal to people on the basis of understanding that, you know, the Scholz government taking them into the, the war in Ukraine had created all these economic problems and all these different challenges. So I think the point you're making is 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 100% correct. I mean, I think we see, uh, you know, you could even put it in people who won. I mean, you look at Mr. Modi, who did succeed in India, but with a much reduced majority. And most people sort of chalk that up to the fact that the uh, India Alliance opposition ran a campaign that was very heavily focused on the inability of the BJP government to address the cost of living crisis and deliver as it concerns economic de 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 deliver for people as it concerns economic development. So, I mean, you have this broader issue here where capitalism as a system is becoming more and more unsustainable. I mean, the various different contradictions that exist within it are, 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 are you know, essentially things that cannot be resolved. And I think it's becoming clearer and clearer over time as you start to look at all these issues that whether we're talking about climate change, like, you know, there's there's more than enough food to feed everyone in the world. Uh, there is more than enough housing. There's more than enough, like, there's not like there is really any, we're not living in a shortage economy, either in the United States or on a worldwide level, actually, quite frankly. We're living in an economy where there are artificial shortages because the primary issue of how society is organized in the United States, in the global north, and around the world more broadly, except for a few countries, is to organize everything to make a profit. Clothes are made not to put clothes on people's back, to make 
make a profit. Homes are made not to put shelter over people's heads, but to make a profit. Food is grown not to actually feed people, but to make a profit. Water even is basically produced primarily only to make a profit. Uh, I, I mean, you look at almost every single thing that exists in society, and even where it's not made to make a profit, when it's a public utility, every single public utility around the world is totally under attack because they say, well, the reason the public utilities aren't that good is because they're not designed to make a profit. So we live in a world that's creating artificial scarcity and artificial shortages as opposed to applying the human and material resources that we have at hand to meet pay people's needs, to have a people first versus a profit first reality. And more and more people are growing increasingly frustrated. And it's playing out in a lot of different ways. Some of it's right wing, some of it's left wing. You know, there's all sorts of different elements of the politics. But what it really all boils down to in a serious way, from my point of view, is that people are increasingly frustrated that things that seem that they should be easy to solve are not getting resolved. And the same small, tiny clique of people who are the elite of every society seem to just be making out like bandits. Like people can see that not only are something is something Something wrong, but that those who are in charge of society are certainly uh, the ones who seem to be benefiting no matter how much other people are hurting. And they're figuring that something new, something different has to be done. They're looking to make different changes to their government. You've got the rise of all sorts of you know, in the mainstream discourse, they call them the extremes. I don't really like to say that, but you know, you have sort of more pure right-wing movements. You have the rise of more left-wing and socialist movements. I mean, you have, you know, ideas that have been sort of pushed out of the mainstream of the capitalist reality being brought more back in because people are desperate for solutions. They're desperate for answers because it's so clear, like, how is it possible we have these problems when we have so much wealth? How is it possible that things are so bad for me while the billionaires keep, seem to keep getting richer and richer? How is it that we allegedly live in a democracy, but it seems increasingly that the desires of the voters are not reflected in the results at the ballot box or the policies of the people who take power. And people in that moment are casting about. They're looking for whatever they can try to find to make a change. And I think that we have to put it in that context. I'm glad you raised this issue. The worldwide context is huge. Capital is an entire global worldwide system. Uh, the U.S. and the European countries dominate this worldwide system. They have a rules-based international order where they make the rules and everyone else is supposed to follow. But the reality is the rules of that game are breaking down because they don't actually help to solve or resolve anything. And people more and more are pushing back and looking for alternatives. I mentioned that uh, Kamala Harris ran to the right, meaning she tried to pretend she was a Reagan-like Democrat. I mean, you know, trying to win over Republicans. I want you to talk, if you can, about whether that succeeded. Did she increase her, quote, Republican uh, vote because she was clearly running to the right. She was running around the country with Liz Cheney, who's really, really right wing. And her father, of course, is the really the architect of the Iraq war, who was also supporting Kamala Harris. Uh, you know, did it increase uh, Republican votes for the Democrats? I mean, this is what the Democrats always do. When the right gets stronger, they move to the right. They don't say, hey, we're going to we're going to have a clear left wing anti right wing anti capitalist program. No, they're so wedded to Wall Street, so wedded to the corporations, so wedded to the military industrial complex, and so insipid when it comes to fighting the right that they embrace the right. So did it work? Well, from what I saw, it did not work. I, I haven't had the opportunity to go super deep into it, but I did see at least one poll that uh, it actually went down 1%, the support for registered Republicans uh, uh, for Kamala Harris. It certainly was below 10%. So we're in the single digits, and it was less than where they were in 2020. So it seems like it actually did not work at all. And in fact, I, I mean, it, it's to your point, I think it could have backfired against them to some degree because there are so many you know, odious things tied to many of these Republicans especially the neocon wars. I mean, this is an issue that Trump, of course, was bringing up quite a bit uh, in relationship to the Cheneys right there at the end, saying that, like, how could any Muslim or Arab person support the Democratic ticket when they're bringing out the guy who are the, per the people who are supporting and invading Iraq and all of these other countries? So hypocritical it may be for Trump, but nonetheless, I think it is he's spot was spot on in some senses that it probably it, it was such a glaring contradiction that it undoubtedly must have driven some people to stay home or to vote against or to do some other thing because it was such a cynical approach. I mean, to say that somehow, you know, there's this mythical Republican Party. I mean, they invaded Iraq in 
you know, I, we don't even know how many people they killed. Some people say a million, some people say a few hundred thousand, but it was so many people, we don't even have a good tally of how many people ki were killed, and that in and of itself should tell you something. These are the people who presided over, you talk about democracy being on the ballot. I mean, you're talking about Lynn, uh, Liz Cheney and some of these other people um, who were supporting her, who were supporting the, you know, global, worldwide, black site torture network, the Guantanamo Bay torture camp that's misnamed the prison camp where they're holding people, uh, you you know, completely lawlessly, uh, basically for their entire lives. They can't bring almost any of them to trial because they've tortured them so much, they're afraid even in a military commission. So basically, even in like a sham star chamber kind of court, they wouldn't be able to get some of the evidence in because they did so much to abuse those who are detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, the NSA spying, all these other pieces. I mean, all the things that they're saying are so bad about Trump that make him look more authoritarian or whatever it may be are things that the Bush administration was doing quite a bit, things that the Reagan administration was doing quite a bit. And this attempt to create this mythical, you know, past, I mean, Reagan, who started his 1980 campaign, you know, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers, actually many more people than that, had been lynched in the summer of 1964 in a reign of terror across Neshoba County to prevent black people from, from taking to the polls and voting and being able to integrate public facilities. I, I mean, these are the people you're saying was like the great mythical you know, Republican Party. Uh, I mean, Democrats were just as complicit, of course, in mass incarceration. But, uh, you know, you can look at certainly the role that Reagan played in that, the invasion of Grenada abroad, uh, you know, the 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 demonization of, of, of uh, you know, those on public assistance. I mean, all these different things that you could put out there that are so reprehensible. And you think somehow you're trying to say, but those people are actually good as compared to Trump. I mean, they touted a letter from former Reagan and Bush administration officials as if somehow that should be moving to people. And it's notable because when you go back to those time periods in those elections, 1980, 84, 92, 96, uh, you know, so on and so forth, the Democrats had very similar rhetoric about them then, that these people were the worst of the worst. You know, I, I mean, I, you could tell me better than 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 I can remember because I wasn't alive then, but I think the rhetoric of fascism was actually used against Reagan in 1980 by some elements of the liberal, uh, you know, sort of world. So, I mean, you can see that a, a, the, the rhetoric at that time was, you know, not too dissimilar from the rhetoric they're using against Trump, but now those same people have been transformed into the greatest people ever, despite their records uh, and despite past denunciations yeah somebody asked me at um i went to a diplomatic event here in new york city in 1976 that was the year gerald ford became the republican nominee and one of the people from this diplomatic embassy from this embassy said who do you think will be president of the united states the next president and i said whoever it was that i said and i said who do you think the next president will be and they that person said to me I th we think it'll be Ronald Reagan. And I said, oh, that's impossible. Ronald Reagan could never be president of the United States. He's too right wing. That's how right wing we thought Ronald Reagan was, that he could never, ever be president. That was in 1976. But in 1980, there was a political realignment. And maybe we're witnessing another political realignment, again, as a failure of the Democrats. And Reagan indeed did become president of the United States. And now you have the Democratic Party, who at that time was kind of echoing the idea that Trump might be a fascist, and now saying, I mean, uh, Reagan might be a fascist. Now they're saying, yeah, we, we long for that period. Well, in one way, Eugene, Ronald Reagan was actually to the left of Kamala Harris's program in 2024 because in 1986, Reagan signed an immigration reform bill, what was originally called the Simpson-Mazzoli bill, and that allowed three million people who were undocumented, in the current language, illegal aliens, to become citizens or to have a pathway to citizenship. And many, many more people were given legal status. Ronald Reagan actually, that was the last time there was immigration reform, was 1986. That's almost 40 years ago. Yeah. And no. you have Kamala Harris today saying, we're going to build a wall. We're going to make it. I mean, she sounded more, actually more like Trump about this get tough on immigrants at the end of her campaign than Ronald Reagan. In other words, if you really look at this trajectory in American politics, the Democrats are the party of Reagan. That's how far right things have gone with the Democratic Party. 
No, I think it's a good point. And, and it, you know, listen, if you if you look at the Republican Party platform of 1980 when Reagan first ran, you might be surprised how much of what was in there was actually implemented by Bill Clinton in 1992 through 1999, um, especially as it concerns many of the issues around public assistance, uh, you know, the so-called welfare reform and so on and so forth. And let's just remember that in that 1992 campaign that Bill Clinton really rolled out a whole tough on the border thing himself to try to criticize the Republicans similarly for not being tough enough on the border. And of course, once he becomes the president in the mid 1990s, he actually pursues a border policy that is designed to drive people into the most dangerous parts of the desert, hoping they die in order to hopefully deter them, deterrence through death. I mean, and that was their open program. So this is part of, you know, really a long term agenda. I mean, I, I said to multiple people, you know, in the lead up to this election that when you look at like, quote unquote, Project 2025 and Trump, the biggest mistake we could make is to say that Trump is some sort of new phenomenon. Like I actually view Reagan as a part one and, and Trump as a part two of the exact same program. And I'm glad you raised the issue of 1976, because I think we can date it to Reagan's primary run in the Republican uh, primary there in 1976 to the creation of this project, which was, you know, really initially incubated... Um you know, starting with the, the 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 Powell memo and this huge push by corporate America to wage an offensive against all of the things that they thought were terribly uh, terrible in terms of what was happening to the country, which was the rise of the Great Society programs, the elements of the Civil Rights Act that were infringing upon, you know, what they believe was infringing upon private property, the rise of the consumer rights movement, the rise of the environmental movement, the fact that there is a growing space in society for intellectual challenges to either capitalism as a whole or at least elements of capitalism. They felt, and this was the essence of the Powell memo, that they were losing control of society. The elites who ran society were worried that things were getting away from them a little bit. And so they came up with a plan, and this was embraced by all of the biggest corporations on earth. Uh, uh, the Lever News Agency has a, a podcast out actually about this that I encourage people to go check out and, and listen, and how they all formed up in the 1970s. They formed think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, right? Right at the center of Project 2025 and many of the other, you know, foundations that are right in this similar piece. And they decided they were going to put together a political program designed to roll back workers' rights, civil rights, women's rights, consumer rights, and environmental rights in order to make sure that they could have as much ability to profit as they possibly could and that they would also make a huge sort of thing underlining all of this big, ta big tax cuts so that they were able to then keep more of their ill-gotten gains that they would be getting by steamrolling over all of the constituencies that I just mentioned. And when Reagan came in, they did some of it, couldn't get it all. And in fact, they actually upset a lot of people in the population. They were trying to do a little too much, which allowed the Democrats to come in. But then Clinton triangulates, as they famously call it, and he brings in a little bit more. Bush comes in and brings a little bit more. But the kind of halfway measures of Clinton, of Bush, elements even of Obama, it didn't quite get it. The rate of profit for capitalists, which is, you know, what they care about, how much money do they get for how much money they put in, was still basically trending downward. It had some ups and some downs, but it wasn't like things were really coming back. So they needed part two to what they they had started with part one under Ronald Reagan, and Trump was part two. This aggressive uh, acceleration of a right-wing pro-capitalist, pro-business offensive to destroy workers, oppress people, uh, anyone whose you know demands make it so that you might have 50 cents left less profit uh, in the pockets of the, the ultra-rich and the super-rich, and they pursued that program. So Trump is really a culmination of, I think, a lot of what was being started under Reagan in this attempt to actually roll back these reforms that were made because working-class people, uh, black people, others had risen up and demanded elements of their rights, demanded changes to the economy, and so on and so forth. And insofar as there was a social crisis and a social explosion, the ruling elites in America found a way to adapt to that to try to buy people off, essentially. Um, but insofar as they've been able to roll it back, they want to. It hasn't been as aggressive as they'd like to. And they brought in Trump to be the agent of pushing this. So I think there's a strong connection between Reagan and Trump in terms of what their agenda really is. I think there's a continuity between them. Uh, and I think there is an a, a important recognition for all of us to see that this is not really a struggle between Democrats. Democrats and Republicans. This is a struggle between the decline of capitalist dynamism 
and the rights of working class people. Because there is no way that you can improve the life of the average person in America without infringing upon the rights of capital to make profit at all cost. So those two things are continually colliding. And that's been our politics since 1976. And it's gonna continue to be our politics until there's a political agenda that can start to define that battle and to assemble the political forces, which will include, by the way, some people who are voting and supporting for Donald Trump, assemble the political forces that can actually push back against entrenched power that is behind both major parties. I mean, you had 150 billionaire families contribute $2 billion to this election. You have $4.5 billion of outside money spent on this election. That's primarily dark money from rich people. They control both parties. They're pushing the same agenda. The Republicans, it's the, the Reaganite, you know, 1970s business corporate fight back that they haven't fully gotten in. They're going back to try to go on the offensive. The Democrats are like, we don't want to go that far because we're worried about provoking a social explosion, but we're going to make sure that it only continues to drift to the right and that there's no significant movement uh, that happens to the left. And they're moving everything in that direction. So if you want to move it back, there has to be a cogent political movement that can actually talk about that put it in its right space, talk about the right solutions, which are socialism, and mobilize politically in order to move that agenda forward. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and it speaks to the, the need not to become a tail to the Democratic Party's kite, not to follow this or that faction of the ruling class, for the working class socialist movement, for the unions, for the community organizations, for mass movements, uh, to, to chart an independent path of the ruling class and in opposition to both wings of the ruling class because even though they fight so you know, vigorously to see who's going to be in charge of the state with all of its lucrative contracts, they basically are representing the same class interests. And we can see this over and over again. And as you're pointing out, Eugene, it's not new. Trump isn't simply Trump. You might think of him as an anomaly in 2016. You can't think of him as an anomaly now. And Trump could not be where he is without massive support from sectors of the U.S. ruling class. So if we, if we go back here now, we saw that in the 1960s, and I would say really between 1955 and 1970, there was what I have called, what we have called, a civil rights revolution. It didn't seize the means of production. It didn't overturn property relations uh, fundamentally in the United States. But it led to a massive change, uh, both political, social, economic, and cultural change in the United States. And as a result of the uprising of black America, which then also contributed to the uprising of women and then the gay movement and the disabled movement, all of these mass movements for social change they were so fierce, I mean, really fierce struggles. In 1968, when Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, you know, 120 cities burned down. And then you had, uh, you know, massive social economic reforms and concessions granted by the ruling class. Well, the ruling class never wanted to do all these things. They did it in spite of themselves because of the struggle. Now, if you go back to Reagan, Reagan nominated four of the nine Supreme Court justices. He was followed by George H.W. Bush, who nominated two more of the Supreme Court justices. At the same time that you were talking about the creation of these right-wing think tanks, trying to figure out how to undo the social advances of the civil rights movement in the late 1970s and early 1960s, uh, 1980s, you had the Federalist Society, which decided to use the courts because they couldn't really have a frontal assault against black America and its strength. They wanted to sort of incrementally around the edges uh, do away with these reforms. And so they developed this kind of school, the, the law school to Supreme Court or court pipeline. So in the last years, in the last decades, the Supreme Court now is dominated by the Federalist Society. Six of the nine judges are Federalist Society right wingers. That's a plan. Reagan appointed 83 appeals court judges, 290 federal district court judges. And during Obama, in the last year when, there was, when Scalia died and he nominated Merrick Garland to be the Supreme Court justice, uh, the Republicans wouldn't even hold a hearing about it. So for a year, there was a vacant seat. And then Trump came in and nominated three more justices who are ultra right wing. What did the Democrats do about this? Did they stage protests? Did they call people into the streets? 
No, they did nothing. Anyway, go ahead. No, it's a great point you make there, and I'm glad you bring up the Federalist Society to connect two points here that we've been talking about. I mean, Leonard Leo, who is the you know is the sort of maestro of setting up the whole Federalist Society thing, has actually now become one of the key pivot points for all of the right wing dark money. So like all of the huge sums of money coming from billionaires, people with hundreds of millions of dollars to support just all manner of right wing causes, various foundations tied to him are, uh, you know, coordinating a lot of that. And I think that's actually a really important fact because it shows that he was so successful in organizing and, and executing this legal plan that you just mentioned that now all the big rich right wingers are like, well, yeah, like let's get this guy to coordinate the whole thing. Um, and I think it just speaks so much to the nexus of big money and this far right offensive on so many different levels that is really about, you know, making sure that there are no hands tied by uh, uh, the capitalist uh, corporation, uh, you know, uh, uh, that the corp capitalist corporations don't have their hands tied. I mean, to speak to your point about the civil rights movement, I, I mean, in a way, it's worth noting because. You know, we look at what happened with the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. The one that ultimately passed was watered down from the original one. And what was the big issue that was preventing a number of really Republicans at that point in the North who were very conservative uh, pro-capitalist Republicans from supporting the original bill was property rights. And they were saying that this bill goes way too far because it allows the government to dictate to private property owners how they run their business because it was obviously laying the basis to integrate public accommodations and other elements like that. Now, the point being they, they watered the bill down. But I think the key point being here is even though, as you say, the civil rights movement was not necessarily seizing the means of production, it was infringing upon the rights on, uh, of capital. And it was raising the sort of specter of the idea that, you know, there are things that are more important than profit. And that in certain circumstances, business owners shouldn't be able to do whatever they want to do with their property. Now, of course, if you look at the essence of the bourgeois revolutions that swept the world in the 18th century, mainly in the Atlantic Basin, that was the point, that your property was sacrosanct and you should be able to do whatever you want. And if the government wanted to do anything with it, they had to compensate you for it. But the Civil Rights Act was starting to say, well, you know, listen, in certain circumstances, we might just force you to do something. The same thing with the consumer rights movement. And I think you have to connect those two aspects as well. I mean, you know, when you're challenging the entrenched power structure of the Jim Crow South, that wasn't just racism, but the Jim Crow solid South political system, these people were the most anti-communist, the most pro-business, many of them deeply anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, like real reactionary people. And having a solid South political block helped drag the whole political scene to the right. So once the civil rights movement started to break that up, the political possibilities for progressive policy became bigger because they had broken up the sort of traditional uh, uh, bridle that was put on the political system by the capitalist class by the with the solid south and they hadn't yet figured out something to contain it so the civil rights movement the consumer rights movement the environmental movement the women's movement I, I mean to some degree even things like you know medicaid and medicare we're starting to say that in certain circumstances you know you shouldn't just be able to do whatever you want to do with your property like the government should be able to force you to do certain things that are either morally right and just uh, or overall for the common good of society in a social and economic way. And I think for capitalists, that's a slippery slope. So even though it wasn't like the Bolsheviks storming the Winter Palace, it was still like, well, if we let them start doing this, they might be storming the Winter Palace, so to speak. And we don't want to really, we don't want to go down that slippery slope. So let's try to stop it, uh, you know, right where it is, prevent that avalanche from taking place, and then see if we can find a way to roll that boulder back up the hill. Sorry to mix my metaphors there, but I think it's an important factor when we understand uh, uh, the reality of what this actually meant to the capitalist class. Like they see to us, to average people, it seems like small things. But to the people who have so much wealth and so much privilege that is only achieved on the backs of others, the more the masses of people are empowered to, you know, pursue whatever their agenda may be, the more they fear that that agenda could turn against them. I mean, this is in fact why Madison, James Madison said in Federalist Paper number 10, one of the most important ones, the one about factions, you read it in your civics class, that the most durable faction between rich people and poor people and the importance of setting up a legislative infrastructure was to manage that relationship so that the interest of poor people did not over 
overtake the interests of rich people. I'm paraphrasing, but that is in its essence, you know, what the American democratic quote unquote system is all about. It's why there has been such a reaction, um, you know, to what has taken place from the labor movement, the civil rights movement, other things like that. And it's why there is this aggressive pro-capitalist attempt that is bipartisan, funded by the richest people, designed to push that back as soon as they could. They couldn't do it right away. They had to acquiesce in the time of social explosion. And then in the mid 70s, you know, late 70s, when different things were happening and they saw their opportunity, they started moving very aggressively to roll it back. They're still doing the same thing today. I'm looking at the New York Times. I want to read it, um, Eugene, and then come back to the point that you're just making. America hires a strong man. This is about Trump having been elected. This was a conquering of the nation, not by force, but with a permission slip. Now America stands on the precipice of an authoritarian style of governance never before seen in its 248-year history. I mean, really? I mean, when you think, go back to the 1887 Constitution and what you're talking about. I mean, George Washington, he won the first and second presidency unanimously. Uh, the word democracy does not appear in the U.S. Constitution that was adopted in 1887 in secret by a group of very rich slave owners and merchants, capitalist merchants in the northern states. Uh, women could not vote. Uh, most black people were actually enslaved people. White men who did not own property didn't get the vote until 1828. That was like 40 years later after the democratic uh, new government was formed. There was no Bill of Rights in the original U.S. Constitution. I mean, these words authoritarian, or like we talked about last week, the word fascism and the word authoritarian and the word strongman. I mean, it's always been an authoritarian government. It is, in fact, a dictatorship. It's a dictatorship of property. It's a dictatorship of wealth. It's a plutocracy, not a democracy. And the systems, the laws, the police, the courts, the prisons, they're not for billionaires. They're not for multimillionaires. They're for working class people, for their instruments of social control. So we on the left, and, and this is the socialist program, we have to completely reject these liberal capitalist labels that Trump is for the first time in American history, a strong man in an authoritarian government, and those decrepit American people voted for him, so they gave him a permission slip to create an authoritarian government. Well, what was slavery? What was Jim Crow? What were the Japanese internment camps? What were the fact that when workers went on strike, they would be routinely shot down by the bosses, along with you know private uh, you know goon squads, along with the police forces. I mean, everything about capitalist rule is authoritarian. There are different forms that government takes, but bottom line, it's an authoritarian system. Yeah, no, it's good. It's, you know, sorry, I was looking down a little bit there, Brian, but I was actually looking something up as you were saying that. I was trying to look at uh, some of the people arrested under John Adams under the Alien and Sedition Act, where they, you know they arrested a number of of printers and publishers for things like, uh, you know, calling. President Adams, of course, uh, saying that he was motivated by pomp, ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and self-avarice. And someone was actually arrested and fined for saying things like that. Another person called him blind, bald, crippled, toothless, and querulous uh, was arrested and, of course, died of yellow fever before that happened. But, you know, I'm just making the point here that just making personal insults in a newspaper was enough to be arrested under the Alien and Sedition Acts under John Adams, which were, of course put forward because there is a fear among certain elites in the U.S. government and President Adams himself that people in the United States were too excited about what was happening with the French Revolution and that they may get uh, carried away and bring the guillotine to the elites here in the United States. Uh, but we can go on and on on different points. I mean, the, a lot of the Alien and Sedition Tax is gone. One part that's not gone is the Alien Enemies Act. And Trump says he's going to use the Alien Enemies Act uh, to facilitate his mass deportation campaign. I haven't heard, I actually don't think I've heard one Democrat say anything about the Alien Enemies Act whatsoever, which, by the way, was one of the key authorities used to intern the Japanese Americans. But you'd think if they were so concerned about Trump, they would be trying to repeal this, change this, do something, talk about it. I mean, they keep saying all these things about the Insurrection Act. Uh, well, the Insurrection Act, of course, is is not, you know, written by Hitler. It was written by, you know, many American 
founding fathers, essentially, in the context of the uh, Congress of that time, which was trying to bring together all these various things they had been doing called the Militia Acts. Now, why had they been doing these things called the Militia Acts? Primarily because the United States was soundly defeated by a army of indigenous people in a battle. It freaked out all of the original elites of America. This is like not that long after the Revolutionary War. They figured like, whoa, we got to get ourselves together and build an army to crush these Native Americans. But they didn't really have the the, the, the situation to do it yet. So they started to find a way to put the militias under federal control and bring them together to have a stronger instrument to wage a war, a genocidal war against indigenous people. And then on top of that, they realized that these rebellions were starting to happen in what was then the Western back countries around taxes, around different things like that. But basically poor people feeling like the government or relatively poor people feeling like the government was putting too much on them and people who were taking up arms to prevent tax collectors and court judgments and things like like that to be held. And so they also needed to be put down by the military. So the Insurrection Act is rooted basically in the genocide of Native Americans and the desire to put down poor people who are rising up against the authority of the newly established state. Haven't heard one Democrat say, let's get rid of the Insurrection Act. So you're saying, well, Trump is, is Hitler, he's fascist, he's German. Well, I mean, all the things he's saying that they say are so bad that he's going to do, he's actually rooting them in U.S. law and in U.S. tradition. And so the idea, you know, I don't know what's happening at the New York Times. I mean, it is true that the New York Times did digital staff is on strike. Maybe some of those people are fact checkers. And the guy who wrote that analytical article that was on the front page of the news uh, site this morning of the New York Times just doesn't know anything and didn't have anyone to help him out because the ultra rich New York Times can't even pay its own workers a decent wage. But I mean, I think more to the point, liberalism in the United States is a totally limp, vacuous ideology that has lost any vigor that it ever had. And it has become essentially just the handmaiden to a political discourse that's dominated by the far right. They ape the far right. It's not an accident, though, that they ape the far right. They ape the far right because liberalism was an ideology of, of an element in a wing of the bourgeoisie. And the reality is the further right you go, it's not a problem for the richest people because they actually get richer because further right just means more pro-capitalist, more money for rich people, more profit first over people first. But the further you go to the left, the more it means that you're infringing upon the rights of, of rich people to do whatever they want and saying that average everyday people should have more say in how the economy uh, is, is run, how the society is governed, what rights individuals have, and so on and so forth. And rich people just aren't going to go for that. So even amongst the sort of liberal bourgeoisie, they have been, I think, willfully acquiescing to the drift to the right because they want a lot of what is happening in the drift to the right. They just don't want all of it. So they want their politicians to try to hold the line on a handful of things that they would prefer not to see, but to generally go along with the general drift. So I think that even statement by the New York Times shows how liberalism is, 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 is in the Democratic Party and everything around it. There's just no solution what Whatsoever. It's the most ignorant statement you could possibly make. I mean, you already said it, the genocide of Native Americans, Jim Crow, slavery, uh, the internment of Japanese Americans, which, by the way, at, at that time, you know, just before that, if you were from Japan and you lived in America and California, you couldn't even own land. I mean, that was the nature of what was happening in this country. So to say this is unprecedented, it's maybe really only unprecedented for the upper middle class white people who populate a large subset of the executive and writing tiers of the New York Times. Times, the Washington Post, the CNNs, the major parts of, of, of the news, who their own historical background has in the, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, can't understand that at all because it was their parents, their great grandparents, their grandparents and great grandparents that set up these systems, you know, of Jim Crow, of the McCarthyism, of this, of that. I could go on and on and on here, but I think it just shows the historical ignorance, which is not a surprise when you think about it, like we put all these things together, that it's become such a, a, a weak opposition to this drift to the right. Yeah. You know, those sheltered, privileged, upper middle class people who think they're so smart say such stupid things precisely because they are privileged and they are sheltered and they live in their own world. And, you know, to be able to talk about the U.S. being authoritarian for the first time in U.S. history shows, and I'm sure this person went to college, probably got a master's, considers themselves smart and educated. But that's stupid. That's dumb. Uh, but it, again, the stupidity uh, isn't organic. It doesn't come because somebody is stupid as an individual. It's a social phenomena. 
And, you know, again, that it also explains why the Democratic Party and these Democratic Party elites have so much trouble uh, winning over uh, working class people. And they always blame the working class. As soon as something, something goes wrong for them, they blame the working class. Hillary Clinton did it. I mean, when you go back to the COVID relief program, whereby even started under Trump, where fam and then continued under Biden. But, you know, during that period, there was lots of economic assistance for masses of people because of the 60 million people were out of work. Working class families got $300, uh, $300 per child per month. That, ended, that uh, reduced childhood poverty by 50% in one year. And then, and then Biden let it go. He spent all of his time talking to right wing Joe Manchin behind the scenes in closed door settings, begging Joe Manchin, this right winger from Wisconsin, also a capitalist and his daughter's a capitalist, uh, begging them to, like, listen to uh, Biden's reform policy, the Build Back Better. And finally, Manchin said, no, I'm not going to vote for it. And Biden was like, OK, well, that's why they can't attract and appeal to the working class. And it's we have to reject those people, including some people on the left, who say, look at how backward the working class is in the United States. They voted for Trump. Well, no, that's not the answer. We have to build a movement against capitalism. And it's not enough to just be anti-Trump. I think if we take a policy of like, we have to fight Trump, stop Trump, Trump's an authoritarian, that's going to go nowhere. We need a working class program. We need to demand that the trillion dollars a year spent for death and destruction for imperialist wars be used for, for flood relief, for hurricane relief, for, you know, so many people in the South who don't have uh, uh, flood insurance or wind insurance right now who can't really rebuild their homes. People who, you know, one half of all the bankruptcies in the United States is because people can't pay their doctor's bills. Instead of spending uh, all of the tax dollars in the country for death and destruction, which is really just welfare for capitalist war, make, uh, war profiteers, do it for the working class. Defend immigrant rights and immigrant families, many of whom have been here not in the last year or two when Venezuelans and Cubans came because of sanctions. They've been here for decades. Those are our brothers and sisters. Those are people who we work with. Defend them because it's the right thing to do. Don't join the right wing in the attacks. But in other words, a working class program that speaks to the needs of the working class against capitalism that's the way to fight the right, not to hand wring and denounce and condemn people who happen to vote for Trump. The, the reason Trump won was no other reason than the failure of the capitalist Democratic Party, which in so many ways looks like the capitalist Republican Party. Anyway, Eugene, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, well, I think those are all good points. I mean, Trump won Nebraska. Deb Fisher, the senator, uh, won the Senate race. But 73% of people voted in favor of paid sick leave, man mandatory paid sick leave, five to seven days, depending on the size of the business. You had seven, to t seven, seven out of the 10 of the abortion referendums that were on the ballot to enshrine the right to abortion did succeed. And many of them were in, quote unquote, deep red states. And in Florida, where it didn't succeed because you have to reach this 60% threshold, you still had 57%. So a very large majority of people in a state that's known as deep red. Alaska, not necessarily known as the world's most progressive state. A lot of Republicans, a lot of right wingers come out of Alaska. Uh, pretty overwhelmingly passed here. Oh, I didn't write down the exact situation, um, but overwhelmingly passed something called Measure 1, which will increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, require 40 hours of paid sick, paid sick leave, and very importantly, will actually ban captive audience meetings, right? So that's when you try to form a union and they make you go to these terrible meetings saying that you shouldn't join a union, so on and so forth. So pushing back against union busting. So there's a lot of different points I could make here, but I, I think the point I often make to a lot of people is that consciousness is not really linear. You know what I mean? People do hold contradictory views in their head. And there are a lot of people who voted for Trump for a range of reasons, who voted for Kamala for a range of reasons, who have all sorts of different beliefs, good, bad, and indifferent. And we can't just look at this sort of partisan red-blue divide, Democrat-Republican or divide, and think that that's some sort of end-all, be-all, or that even that it represents a totalistic ideological viewpoint. I think amongst very few people, their vote does their vote represent a totalistic ideological viewpoint. And I think when you really look at a lot of sort of social science research, I think a lot of people generally 
the thing people hate about rancor and why like both sides getting along is relatively popular because there are many different things that people generally tend to support higher taxes on wealthy people tend to be relatively uh, majority support. I mean, there's so many different issues that often have very majority support. So I think there's actually less divide on a number of core issues than we think, but there are some issues where there are deep divides, and those issues tend to be the issues that are played on the most by the two major political parties to divide working class people and to split them up into different camps that they can exploit for their own vote catching. So it's not that if there's no difference between them, but I think it often misses the, the, the strong similarities and the fact that we have a possibility to change politics in this country, but I think only if it's really rooted in the real roots of what the problems are, which then speak to what the real solutions of what the problems are, which I think then starts to lay the basis for bridging the gap on the things that have become so divisive in our politics. And I think that there's a lot of examples for that. And honestly, even if there weren't a lot of examples, I still think it's just materially true and we have to continue to push forward and fight on the basis of what's really happening, not just sort of made up historical or contemporary temporary narratives, which is essentially what the Democrats and the liberals are doing. So, you know, it's it's going to be a time in America where I think the question will be, do people uh, give up their agency and just acquiesce to the worst possible policies? Or will people rise up and create a social crisis? Because the whole issue with COVID-19, there is the potential of a social crisis. All of a sudden, they're handing out checks to people. Uh, the issue of the civil rights movement, there is a social crisis. All of a sudden, they're dismantling Jim Crow. Uh, you know, the issue of the, the sit-down strike, you know, in GM in 1937, made the steel companies say, you know what? We don't even really want that smoke with these unions, so here's a contract. I mean, when you create a social crisis, you have the ability to uh, uh, to, to take uh, gains, to, to use that as leverage, to move forward your agenda. But if you want to go beyond that, you actually have to take power. It's not just about having leverage, not just about having influence, it's about power, which means changing our system entirely, displacing those who think that profit should be before people, and making sure our governing structures empower people over profit. Couldn't agree with you more. People can make the change, Eugene. Uh, all of those things that you talked about, the labor movement's gains, the unemployment insurance, the Wagner Act, the right to unionize, the end of segregation, the right to abortion, uh, the right to marriage equality. Uh, none of those were gifts from capitalist politicians. Those were from real struggles of the people. But we need a radical transformation in society so that all of these gains can never be reversed. And in fact, all of the needs of the working class and all of the people in society can be met. And as you also said, these are achievable things. This is not utopian. The only thing that inhibits and obstructs this reality from coming into existence is the capitalist system. But we, the people, have to build that movement. Eugene Perrier, thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. 